Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. Begin reading verse number 14. The Bible says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before Him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Now, verse number 14, King Solomon writing unto his sons, and then the nation of Israel, and then down through history, everybody that's gotten a copy of the Word of God, says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. That only makes sense. God being an eternal, omnipresent being, if He does something, it is eternal, and it is established for eternity. A man can build an edifice, but it is not permanent. In fact, all those people every year travel to see the wonders of the world. There are the seven lost wonders of the world that some of them don't, the only one we got left is the Great Pyramid of Giza. The rest of them have been destroyed, they've been torn down, they've been, you know, collapsed under uh, natural disasters. But even if you go see, all them people flock to see the Taj Mahal, or they go to see the Great Pyramid of Giza, they go see the Empire State Building, Sears Tower, all those things, they don't look the same as the day that they was built. In fact, the Pyramid of Giza, they tell me, I don't know, nobody was ever there to see it, but they tell me that now it's got the stair steps on the side. Those were not the finishing blocks. In fact, they had smooth sides all the way down that pyramid at one point. But what happened to them? Well, they're gone. Well, where'd they go? I don't know. Either somebody took them, or erosion wore them things, you know, pretty far down. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying, go look at the house that you live in. Unless it was built yesterday, it's showing signs of weather and nature and just time having an effect on it. Not saying that it's unlivable. Every now and then you just got to put a little bit of caulk in a, you know, a gutter. Right? Or every now and then you got to call Brother Ray to go figure out where the roof's leaking. Because right? you know there's water up there, you just don't know where it's coming in at. But right? how does that happen? Well, a lot of it is through the seasons. As seasons progress, we know that the Bible refers to seasons as a metaphor for different chapters of your life. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes tells there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. There's a time to grow, then there's also a time to grow old. Right? There's a time to plant, there's a time to reap. Right? Those seasons represent changes in your life. Well, natural seasons represent changes to those things around them. Winter, very hard on man-made things. Don't care if it's a road, don't care if it's your roof, don't care if it's your car. Right? When water turns into ice, it has an effect on things around it. When those things that are used to being in 60, 50, 70 degree weather, it gets down to zero or colder, they react a little bit different. All those electronics in your car, even if you got it in a garage, when it starts getting cold, they start acting different. Has anything changed about them? No, the only thing that's changed is what's going on around it. But yet those things have an impact on those things. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Nothing that man has ever done. Even those things that have lasted the longest of what we have records of. They don't look the exact same way the day that they were built. Why is that? Well, because, short, short answer, sin. When sin entered into the world, the world became a non-permanent place anymore. Because death entered by sin. Before that, the world was just as permanent as God was. Before that, man was just as permanent as God was. Because God made man in his own image. God made the world according to his intentions. And in Genesis 1 tells us everything that he made, that he looked at it and saw that it was good. What does that mean? It was exactly how he wanted it. And it would have stayed that way, lest what? Sin. Why does erosion happen? Right? Why do things that 
seem to be tough and hard. You let water run over for a little bit, all of a sudden they got a groove cut in them where the water was flowing. How come your yard won't stay the way that it was the year before? There's always something where there's a, div there's a pothole, there's something there that wasn't there last year, but rain took it away, washed it out, made it a little bit deeper. Why is that? Because everything about the world that we live in is impermanent. Right? Why do you think that there's always road construction going on? Because they can't build one that lasts. It's not against them. I mean, it, it takes a whole lot of brain power to figure out, you know, concrete and engineering and all the different grades and all that kind of stuff. It's not their fault. Right? It's sin's fault. The way that God made it, God made a road, it stayed perfectly flat and square for the rest of eternity. But see, why is road construction always going on? Because them cars going over it, that weigh thousands of pounds, and those trucks and 18-wheelers uh, that cross bridges and drive on that brand new asphalt, it weighs a whole lot. And it makes little tiny cracks. And then winter comes and water gets in them little tiny cracks during the day, and then it freezes again overnight, and they become big cracks. Why does that cycle seem to play out in our life? That, we understand that. That's natural to us because it's what we were born into. It's what we understand. Things don't last. Right? If they did, I'd have a whole lot of suits that I'd still be able to wear when I didn't tear the pants open from having my hands in my pockets and then causing that little corner at the pocket to rip the seam out. But man makes things to the best of his ability, but none of it's permanent. The best you can get is durable. But you know what durable means? It just wears out slower. Doesn't mean that it lasts. So, he says, I know that whatever God doeth, it shall be forever. How does he know that? Because see, he didn't come by that knowledge by looking at anything in the world. Go read the first two chapters of this book. He looked everywhere. He examined everything under the sun. And he found that all of man's labors were vanity, emptiness. Right? He found that everything that man did, somebody's tried it before and had the same result. He found that every new invention seems a whole lot like an old invention just with a different name tag on it. But all of it, it doesn't last. So why does man keep trying? Because man thinks that one of these days they'll get smart enough ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. One of these days that a light bulb's going to turn on and all of a sudden they're going to have an idea that nobody's ever had before. Well, they may come up with a new process. But whatever they come up with, I can tell you what the result's going to be. Not going to last. I can tell you what the end result's going to be. Somebody's going to try and outdo that. Because if a cell phone was good enough, Nobody would have ever came out with a different type. If black and white television was the best thing that ever happened, we wouldn't have LCD screens today. But if four channels, and all of them shutting off at 9 o'clock at night, was good enough, we wouldn't have cable and satellite and everything else. What happens? Man's desires changes, so man's inventions change. But all of it is based off of what? Man's lust, his desires. And you know what I find? Man's lust and man's desires can never be satiated. Because the flesh, always looking for things to consume to try and fill that hole in his soul. But see, I know that whatever God does, this is going to last for forever. Where did he get that knowledge from? It came from God. God told Abraham, this land's going to be yours. And man may have forgotten about that promise, but God didn't. God said, I'm going to make you people as the stars in the sky. Long after Abraham's gone, he's got a whole lot of descendants down there in Egypt. They forgot about God, but when they remembered and they began crying unto him, he raised somebody up to go down there and deliver them out. God's promises last longer than anything that you can imagine. God's word is forever settled in heaven. The Bible says that he's magnified his word above his very name. 
every word that God has ever spoke or penned down to man, you can't wrap your head around how solid and how good a foundation that is. Because everything that you know, you could take something harder and rub it up against it and flakes are going to come off. It's not permanent. Doesn't last. But see, Solomon writes, whatsoever God doeth it shall be forever. Not just it's going to last for forever. We've already talked about the pyramid down there in Egypt. It's still around, but it's not the way that it was the day that it was first built. When they signed off on it and had the big parade around it or whatever they did to dedicate it and say, hey, it's finally finished, it doesn't look the same. Latter part of the verse, nothing can be put to it. That means whatever God does, it doesn't have any gaps, doesn't have any chinks in the armor. It doesn't have any spots where you can wiggle something loose and then put something else to it. Nothing can be put to it. When God does it, He doesn't leave an opportunity for man to add to what God did. You know what the beauty of a virgin birth is for the way for the Savior to come? You can't add nothing to it can't change who the Father was because the Father was the Holy Ghost. can't change that she had never known a woman, or I mean never known a man, because before she became a woman, she lived with her father. She had never even met Joseph probably. The arranged marriage was between Joseph's father and her father. He went and he's off building a house for her. Then it says that it was discovered that she was with child. That means she didn't even know. God had to come to Joseph and say, hey, don't put her away. Take her unto yourself. The thing that has been done is not a man, it's of God. Nothing can be added to the birth of Christ because God did it. Nothing can be added to Calvary because it was complete. There's a lot of people over the years that have been saying, well, you've got to get saved and then do. Nope. All you've got to do is do what he said. Come unto him and he'll know why he's cast you out. See, if God does it, we know that only God can undo it. But there's a lot of people that have the mindset, well, just because God said that doesn't mean that we also can't do... It sounds to me like you're trying to put something on top of what God already did. That's not going to last. You could take a foundation pour solid concrete foundation and you can stack however many Lego blocks you want to up on top of it it's not going to last as long as the foundation you can't connect Lego to concrete after the concrete's already dried you can try to duct tape it down you can try to glue it you can try to do everything else in the world it's not a part of the concrete you can try and add something to it but yet the only way to add something to concrete is while the process is still happening. While it's still malleable. While it's being poured. If you want to add a design to concrete after it's already dried, it's a whole lot of back breaking, breaking labor. And chances are you're going to have to pour more concrete anyway to get something you can work with. Best you can do is cut relief joints in it. But that's not adding to the concrete. That's not giving anything additional concrete's concrete that makes sense you can't mix oil and water his ways are above our ways our ways are brutish natural we don't understand how God does things because if we did we'd have to be God we don't understand the foresight the planning the way that God has everything organized and orchestrated in our lives all that we know is that if he does it, we can't undo it. That doesn't make sense. Now, if we take one of the youngins around here, and I just take a piece of candy and put it in my hand, close it, say, get the candy. Right, the youngins can try and pull and pry at my fingers. Only way that they're getting it is if I open my hand. Because once I put something there, close it up, I say, hey, that's where it's at. They can't undo it. You might be able to. But a youngin can't. They can't understand 
how I can keep my hand closed. It's just that they don't have the ability to open it. Well, God's the same way. You don't understand how God does things. You just know that if he does it, it lasts. But it lasts a whole lot more than what you can comprehend. It doesn't just last through time. But it lasts through every storm and every intensity that you could ever have in your life. You know how they know which lighthouses were built the right way? Because they're still standing today. A lot of lighthouses were built, but a storm came and they fell down. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? If God puts it in your life, it doesn't matter how high the waves come over the deck or the bow. It doesn't matter how hard the wind's blowing or how many sails you got, whether you lost the anchor or you tried to deploy it and it just hadn't found the bottom yet. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If God put it there, it can't be moved. Nothing can be put to it. Doesn't lack anything. You can't add a wreath to the front door of what God built. It's not going to stick. Anything you put on the outside to try and disguise it or try to, you know, reimagine it, you could try and put paint on it, paint won't stick. Nothing can be added to what God has done. You could try. You could try and build around it. What's going to happen? Well, it's not Bible, but I like the illustration. First Indiana Jones movie, they tried to put a name on the side of the box that had the so-called Ark of the Covenant on it. What happened? That sucker burned off. Why? Because you can't label something that God put a name to. That, but Jordan, that's a pretty silly illustration. You get the point. There was a fellow that just touched the cart that the Ark was on, and he died. But I'm pretty sure that God wouldn't appreciate a Nazi symbol on the side of a box that held the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know. I'm of the impression that when God was done with it, he took it back. So good luck finding it. Anyway. Point is, you could try and add to it. What's it going to do? It's only going to cost you. It's only going to take from you. But then it also says, nor anything taken from it. Now, I understand that. I tell people all the time, customers will call up and they'll say, hey, we got this part, we don't know what it is, we need help finding it, I can do that. Then they say, is this going to fix my problem? I don't know that. My job is you tell me what you want and I get you the number to order it. But that's, how, that's what I know how to do. You do not want me working on your machine, I tell them all the time. I'm like, you do not want me touching that thing. I know how to find part numbers. I don't know how to run it. I don't know how to repair it. I don't know. I know what it can do. That doesn't mean I know how to make it do it. One of the guys on the phone the other day says, you probably know this machine better than I do. I said, that is not true. I said, I know how to find part numbers for that machine. You know how to make that machine make money. If I owned it, it'd just be sitting there doing nothing. I don't know how to make it do what it's supposed to do. But... It says nothing can be taken from it. I'm real good at destroying things. I'm a bull in a china shop. You need help with demo? Give me a call. I'm pretty good at that. You want to put something else up in this spot? Don't call me. I'm real good at breaking things. Taking things away from other things. I don't even have to try and do it on purpose. It just happens sometimes. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? you saying you're clumsy? I'm just, not really. It's just every now and then I'll go to grab something and then I just grab it too hard. Right? Or I'll bump into something and because I didn't know that whatever I was getting ready to bump into was there, I took like a full step with all my weight behind it. Now that thing's been moved and things on the inside are broken. Don't mean to do that. It just happens. I understand taking things away from other things. Right? I understand... Unfortunately, hitting the brake and then the brake's not reacting. I get that. Right? Why'd that happen? Well, that happened because one of the calipers seized up and then the brake pad just went and it disappeared. So I'd brake and the car would turn. That didn't make sense. That was fun. But Peter helped me fix that problem. That's back when y'all lived it. Y'all had to drive over and he jacked it up and he's like, uh, we got to go get a brake caliper. I'm like, uh, that sounds fun. 
And Brother Peter showed me a lot of stuff over the years. I'm better at taking things off than I am at putting them on. I can look at it and I can tell you, well, there's your problem right there. How do I fix it? I don't know. I just know that's what's keeping the rest of it from doing what it's supposed to do. How'd you deduce that? I don't know. God gave me that kind of mind. Well, how do I fix it? That's not my job. You asked me to tell you what was wrong or where to get the replacement from because I understand breaking stuff. It don't make sense to me how you could take dirt, the breath of God, and then man happens. That don't make sense to me. But if it made sense, it wouldn't take faith. I understand taking things away from it. You give me something, I'm going to find you a way to break it. If you tell me that there's no way to break it, I'm going to prove you wrong just to prove you wrong. Now, if you tell me there's a way, oh, this is the best built thing in the world, got it. Broke. How'd you break it? I don't know, I just beat it up against stuff until it broke. That makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense that to the world either, or to your carnal man, that God can make and nothing can be taken away from it. We're used to seeing things that are built, and we're used to the endeavors of man and the plans, of, the best laid plans often go to waste. Why? Because you go to lay something out, and things start getting taken away from it. We're used to termites chewing holes in the wood. We're used to moths eating holes in your clothes. We're used to things being laid out, but then slowly over time, things are taken away. That's why nobody in here has a problem buying tires at a certain point. Because you're used to the rubber being worn off of them, little by little. We're used to that. But you can't wrap your head around something that is so pure, so perfect, so established and permanent, that it doesn't matter what you throw at it, nothing's going to chip it away. You say, but Jordan, what about diamonds? If diamonds were so permanent and so hard and indestructible, how'd they cut all them fancy smooth edges on the ones that y'all got on rings? You could cut a diamond. It's not as permanent as you think. In fact, just a little tiny cut or nick or grind pattern on the side of yours, you can bump it up against the wall and it'll shatter. Why? Because it's not as permanent as you, as you think that it is. It may be the hardest thing known to man. Doesn't mean that it's permanent. If it's permanent, they'd never be able to shape it into the things that people wear. Now, that was the beauty of the things that God does. God takes dead things and makes them alive. Right? That's why Aaron's staff was put in the Ark of the Covenant and they carried it. Why? Because God made a stick bloom. A staff that had been used to walk around the desert for a long time. Yet God made it grow. So how did he do that? That's just the way he does things. But see, God had to use the tools of man to give Moses the Ten Commandments. What happened? Moses cast them and they were broken. God's Word had already been established. That's still the same. It's recorded what was written down on them tablets to this day. But the token that God reached down from heaven with His very finger, the Bible tells us, and wrote on those tablets. And just go study the tablets. What is that? It says that you could look through. It was like completely engraved through. You could see the backside. But yet you'd flip it over and then something different would be written on the back. And it was going all the way through. How did that happen? God. It was meant to be a sign that Moses didn't write them suckers. God did. How can it be completely engraved through and then when you turn it over it's not just a mirror image? God. But yet, even those tablets, what were they made on? Stone. Stone lasts a while, but stone's not permanent. Stone can be broke. can be cut. How do you think y'all got them countertops that people pay so much money for? Made out of granite and all these other types of rocks. All they are is pretty rocks. But yet people pay money for it. Why? 
for aesthetics. But yet they know, oh, we've got to take care of the grain of countertop. Don't want it getting scratched. Well, if it's so permanent, how can it be scratched? Well, he's saying, Brother Joe, we're used to things, but we're used to taking things away. We're used to starting with something and then expecting only a little bit to be left over. And I'm not even talking about taxes. We're used to buying something and knowing that it's not going to work the way that it did the day that you bought it. Sometimes, even after a very short amount of time. That makes sense to us. But see, when God did it, He made it exactly how it should be, and then He preserved it to stay that way, not just for a time, but for all of eternity. It says, nor anything take it from and God doeth it that men should fear before him now y'all have all seen the movies where the little guy who runs his mouth a whole lot right is trying to talk himself out of a situation he's backing up out of a room until he bumps into somebody and he turns around and there's a guy about eight times as tall as him looking down at him and then he grabs him that, that guy thought he was the smoothest talker and the smartest guy in that room until what? Until he met somebody who was bigger than him. Then all of a sudden, all that guy's confidence and all his machismo, all of his bluff that he had been talking a few minutes before, it gets sucked out of him just like the wind. And he looks up and he goes, oh, yeah, you're not getting out of this one. See, he thought he was just going to waltz out the door. Until what? Until he found something that he couldn't talk his way out of, walk his way out of, or fight his way out of. Now, that was the beauty of Popeye. He was the smaller dude, but if he ate spinach, he could beat up the bigger dude. Right? We like the underdog. We're used to insurmountable or odds that seem impossible, but yet man somehow finding a way to do it. Right. Y'all know how many people died trying to get to the, mountain, the, top, the top of Mount Everest? And not just before Edmund Hillary got up there with the Sherpa. Right? Even to this day, there are people still trying to get up to the top of Everest that are dying all the time. They use dead bodies as markers to show the trail to get to the top of the mountain. But yet, because people say it's one of the hardest, it's the tallest. Nothing's ever going to be taller than that. And it's real hard to get up there. Why? Because people want to feel special. They want recognition. And they're willing to die for it. You say, it's dumb. I agree. It'd be a different story if they were like, hey, you want to take a car ride up Mount Everest? Sure, why not? Hey, do you want to run the very likely risk of dying to get to the tallest place on earth? I'm good. Oh, it's not that bad, Brother Jordan. You get up there and you, like... It's so high that you start running out of oxygen. I'm good. No, you have to take air with you to breathe it so you don't suffocate at the top of the mountain. No, I'm good. I can breathe right here pretty good. But see, we, we're used to the Rudy stories. Right? Where the one that had no business all of a sudden overcomes and gets recognized for all of his effort and hard work. That's Hollywood. There are people that do it. But if that was enough of an accomplishment, people wouldn't be trying to outdo one another even still to this day. It doesn't make sense to us that there's something in the world that man cannot do. We put people on the moon. right? And not with high tech, with old tech. With ones and zeros in a computer. It's called binary. In fact, your cell phone has enough computing power to do all of the missions that NASA did from the 60s and most of the 70s on its own. All at the same time. It wasn't technology that allowed me. It was a whole lot of guys sitting down and figuring out the math and everything else to tell the computer what it needed to know. We're used to man overcoming things, but when God does it, he makes sure you can't add to it or take away. Why? That men should fear before him. You realize that all throughout history there's a whole lot of people that have thrown themselves at what God has said and what God did only to find out that they can't change it? 
that no matter how much they don't like it, they can hack at it, and they can bulldoze at it, and they can try and do everything in the world to it, but it doesn't move. It just stays the same. And God did not do it to anger man. God did not do it to frustrate man. God did it to prove to man that God was God. They just put one of them, well not just put, a couple of months ago they put a new type of telescope up there in outer space. They're just taking all these infrared photos and everything. You know what they're finding out? The universe is a whole lot bigger than what we thought it was. There's a whole lot more going on than we could even comprehend before that. Well, just imagine when they make the next kind of telescope or, you know, image receiver. Guess what they're going to find? More stuff they didn't know was out there. But yet God called all of them by name. Fixed them in place to where they wouldn't be moved from where God put them. Why is earth in the Goldilocks zone? Because God put it there. And they've searched throughout all the galaxies, and they'll find one every now and then. It's, oh, it seems to be this, that, or the other, only to find out that the surface of that body is toxic. Right? Or the rain's acid. What are you saying? God did one. Then that blows a lot of people's minds because statistically there should be more out there, but there isn't. Because man's without excuse to see all of the things that God permanently did that they can't etch at and they can't take away from or they can't add to and know that He is God. He didn't do it so that man would cower in front of Him. He did it that man would reverence Him. To be without excuse to bow down and say, Thou art Lord of Lord and King of Kings. They're going to do that, Brother Jordan, one day. He's going to roll back the sky. And they're going to see his face and know exactly who he is. They're going to go and run to the mountains and rocks and hills and pray that the rocks fall on top of them so that they don't have to stand before the face of the Lord. They're going to know who he is. Why? Because there's only one like him. And when he does something, nobody does it like him. So let's get to verse 15. That which hath been is now. That don't make sense to man. Right? That's saying that the past is today. Then the next verse it says, That which is to be hath already been. That means tomorrow is also the past. See, I got this thing on my, my wrist. It's called watch. It only ticks in one direction. It only moves forward. In order to make it go backward, I have to stop it and then go back. But once you push that thing in the side, it starts running again. It only runs in one direction. See, to man, time only runs in one direction. That's towards the grave. But see, to God, time is not a thing. God is a now God. Yeah, he's in tomorrow already, but you know what he's concerned with now? You can go back. If you could go back to yesterday, guess where he's going to be at? There. Why? Because wherever you are, that's now. And you know what God's interested in? Now. Doesn't matter where you go, as long as it's still now, you can't get a place where he's not. Because God just is. Doesn't matter where you go, when you go, how you go, he's there because he is. You don't believe me? He said that I am that I am. What's that mean? He is that he is. He is. It's not that he was, it's not that he will be. He is and always will be. Because when you get to wherever you want to get to, he still is. So when God says, That which hath been is now what's that mean you know what God expects today what he expected yesterday what he expected last week what he expected last month what he expected from the foundation of the earth and before that you know what he expects Christ was that Christ slain before the foundation of the world you know what that means? God's expectation has always been Christ. 
That which hath been is now. Look around at everything that man does. You don't want none of that. In fact, you hate when you have to go out and buy a new car. It's nice for a little while until you realize that it's not going to stay new. And then you realize, oh, I'm stuck paying on this for X amount of time. And it's not going to stay the same way that it is now. It's going to keep getting a little worse and a little worse and a little worse until what? Until you need a new one. It's the way of the world. Look at anything that man has ever done. It does not last. Hate to break it to you, as great as the American Constitution is, which I would argue might be one of the greatest documents ever penned by man. These were penned by God, so that's in a different category. But penned by man, one of the greatest documents ever. It's not perfect, and it's not permanent. They did their best by God to try and give a place where people could live and worship freely and be protected. But it's not going to last. But Brother Jordan, that's treasonous. No, that's just truth. I don't find America in the end times in the Bible. It talks about the whelps of the lion, talking about all the former colonies of Great Britain. Doesn't sound to me like America is a whelp. Know what a whelp is? That's not just a baby. That's a small baby. One that relies on its mother to get through. Now, we, we're an eagle. We're soaring. What happens? The eagle's going to fall out of the sky one day. Even the greatest things that we can think of, they don't last. If things lasted, museums wouldn't have to have curators. What are they? They're the people that clean and then protect those things from deteriorating even more. But see, God did it. And you know what was required from the beginning? Just faith. Faith and obedience. It's all that Adam and Eve had to do. Believe that what God said was true and then do what He told them to do. But after they doubted, then after they sinned, what was required? Blood. Well, you say, Brother Jordan, that was the first time that a blood sacrifice was ever made. Oh, no, no. Because the second part of the verse says, that which is to be hath already been. Long before God slew those animals to make those garments for them. Way back in the alpha of time, God had a discussion with God and God, because all three of them were there, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And a conversation was had saying, what's required in order for man to be atoned after he sins? It was blood. But it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't the blood that for a time symbolized what would come one day. He said, it's going to take our blood. You know what's been required from the beginning? Christ. You know when man stands before either the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne of judgment, you know what the standard is going to be? Christ. You know what you're going to be judged out of? Christ. Says, I thought we would be judged out of every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You will, but He was the Word made flesh. And human flesh dwelled all of God's expectations, promises, judgments, and one day... He'll execute all those judgments based off of what? Christ. Brother Jordan, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. True. And you won't know until you get there. But I know what it's going to take for you to overcome it. Christ. Brother Jordan, I don't know how I got through yesterday and I don't know what happened yesterday, how that's going to play an impact in the future. That which has been is that which has already, or that which has been is what it's going to be. I know how you got through it. The old song says, I know how I made it. Made it by faith. But there's a little bit more to that. It's not just faith, it's who you put the faith in. It was your faith in Christ is what got you through yesterday. It was the grace of God that got you through yesterday. It was that pressed down, shaking, bubbling over, 
living off of the goodness of God that got you through yesterday. But why did you receive those things? Because of what had been applied to your life, Christ. So I don't know. Yesterday the foundations of your world may have been shook. I know that this rock's not moving. I know nothing can't be added to it. I know nothing can be taken away from it. And I know that the thing that kept you on that rock yesterday is the thing that's going to keep you on the rock today. That's the blood of Christ. See, I know that in the eyes of God, there is no yesterday, today. A day with Him is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. What does that mean? God cares about now. When is the day of redemption? Today. When's the appointed time for salvation? Now. Why? Because God is here now, always. God doesn't set an appointment and say, well, I'll meet you tomorrow. He says, I'll see you when you get to where I'm at. Where's he at? He's in now. Do you think it was any small thing that Jesus could say that he'd never leave you nor forsake you? Why is that? Because he's always here now. Not just talking about direction. We're talking about time. Every step you take, you know where you're at now. And I know that every now that you get to, the requirement for God's satisfaction, God's approval, and God's blessing is always going to be the same. Christ. Whether he's been applied and whether you, through faith and obedience, have allowed him to have reign in your life. But see, it says, and God requireth that which is past. God's standards are never going to change. He set the standards long before he made the thing that was supposed to be obedient to those standards. Because God where has always been where? Now. He's at every point of time. He's across all time. Doesn't matter where you go. Past, present, future, diagonally. You can look at every potential or every, you know, alternate way that your life could have ended up. Guess where God would have been now? And he'd have been there through the whole thing. What are you saying, brother? His ways are so far above our ways. But I do know that if a thorn comes into your life, it got there because God allowed it to be there. And you can't add to that thorn. You can't take away from that thorn. Only God can remove that thorn. So if it's there, God has a purpose for it. God has a plan for it. God has a time when it will be pared from your life, meaning removed. You may have to go through the grave for that to happen but God knows when it will be removed. If God set you on a course, He knew how rocky, how bumpy, how hilly or mountainous it was going to be. But God knew that wherever you were, you'd be in now. You can't go back to yesterday and relive it as if it were now, because there's only one now. You can't... What's the word I'm looking for here? Pause, rewind, stop, slow motion inside of your head. The soul of man is a now type of vehicle. You can't go you can go back and watch a video from before, but it don't feel the same. Why? Because you're not there. You're now. Why is that? Because the soul that God gave man is just like his. It's a now kind of being. The man in hell couldn't go back and relive all the parties that he had as a rich young ruler. He lifted up his eyes being in torment. He was there now. Guess where he's at today? Same place. Now. The only thing that God requires is that the blood of Christ be applied. Then he asks you by faith to yield your life to him there's only ever been one standard and everything that comes into your life isn't going to change that standard once it's been applied God can't deny that it happened because he does things where nothing can be taken or added to it when God did it he did it 
permanently, but he did it openly. So that men would see what he did and fear or reverence God. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I know that it's real easy to get caught up in now. But every now and then, it do us good. If we just remember that long before we stepped into today, or we stepped into this afternoon, or this evening, God knew what was coming and He said, I'll be there when you get there already. But no matter what it is, it can't undo what I did back at the cross. can't undo what I did when I applied that blood to your life. And as long as that's permanent, everything else doesn't matter. Because as long as you've got Christ, you meet God's requirements. Then go look at all the things that He promised to you because the blood was applied. Then go look at all the things that He gave you here that helped you get through today. That helped you get through yesterday. Why? So that you could always be focused on now. Because now is somebody's appointed time for salvation. Are they going to miss it? Are they going to miss it because of us? Are we going to be a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone? You know where you start thinking about those things? In the now. Too many people looking to tomorrow, looking back at yesterday. All that's going to do is cause you to lose your mind. Because all God's concerned about is now. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.